I'm a blonde in early 40s, wearing glasses and a teal top and the jeans as usual, although you can't see that. And I'm sitting at my desk uh, in my bedroom. And I'll be talking uh, about what we can do better in media accessibility uh, research. First of all, I think it's uh, important to uh, say that there are many different strands of uh, research in uh, media accessibility. I've identified three major ones, but I think uh, there are possibly more. So first of all, uh, there's a lot of descriptive research where you have a corpus and you analyze a product, a translation, an audio description, etc. There's also um, quite a number of uh, process research studies recently, and the main idea there is is to see how certain audiovisual translation or media accessibility products, how they are created by subtitlers, audio describers, uh, users, etc. So we're interested in the people who make them. And also there's reception research where you actually look at viewers, their receptions, their reactions, where you test different solutions, uh, for instance, uh, subtitling, uh, speed, etc. And this is what I'm going to um, focus on, the reception research um, uh, today. In uh, reception research in media accessibility, I think we've started playing with some fancy toys um, recently. So eye trackers, EEG, EDA, heart rate, all sorts of toys. I'll focus today on eye tracking, but, but not only. And I'll be focusing particularly on experimental methods in, um, in media accessibility. And I think you should treat my talk as a teaser to the uh, summer school. So I'll just mention briefly a number of things that could potentially be uh, mentioned and then uh, we'll go uh, deeper to a number of different aspects once uh, we meet again, hopefully in the summer in July. For today, I've identified three main potential issues that are problematic in the way we do things in media accessibility and audiovisual translation and what we can do to uh, make them better. First of all, research designs. I think we tend to use some confounding variables. We tend not to define our variables. We choose them uh, in a particularly uh, relevant way. Our samples are very small or perhaps not necessarily uh, well chosen. Uh, the same applies to research materials. There a number of issues there. A whole area uh, relates to data analyses and this is uh, what I'm not going to talk about much today and also I'll show you a number of examples related to how we can uh, how we report and how we can report better the results of our studies. So I'll focus on research designs and reporting um, uh, for today. Starting with uh, research designs, I tend to uh, review many papers uh, or read theses and then uh, one of the main issues uh, that strikes me really is that not everyone has a research question in the first place. So I think since we have a lot of young researchers here, it's important to realize what is your main research question and uh, also to, to know how it relates to what was done previously. Uh, I think in, in some of the reviews that I do, it seems that the authors haven't really read anything that was done before. They don't even know that things were done. So how, how does previous uh, uh, research and literature, how do they inform uh, your research question and what are your hypotheses? And something a difficult word I couldn't really understand was when I was a PhD student, how can you operationalize your research? What does it mean really? Yes, so how can you move on from your research question to the things that you test uh, when you think about this in um, terms of eye tracking, uh, so which eye tracking measures would be appropriate to answer your research questions. For instance, if you want to study the rereading of subtitles, I would look into revisits or regressions. That's uh, what I mean generally. And talking about eye tracking measures in their papers, Steven Doherty and Jan Louis Kruger, who just spoke before me, sorry, I couldn't attend, I was teaching. They made a very useful distinction between uh, primary eye tracking measures. So these are basically some raw values which you don't have to calculate in anything you just uh, you just measure them and secondary measures uh, which need to be considered as relative to some primary measures so they're calculated against some sort of baseline and what's really important um, i think is how we define uh, and how we understand uh, uh, these measures particularly in the case of secondary measures where we do some calculations 
looking at eye tracking matrix again as dependent variables. Uh, so for instance, as I said, if you wanted to study how much time people spend on the subtitle, you may want to choose uh, dwell time as your dependent variable. But if you want to study the rereading of subtitles, you may be more interested in regressions or revisits to an area of interest. And another thing that's really important in facilitating the replication of uh, a potential replication of our study is that we provide the definitions of these metrics because different eye tracking companies, they uh, use different names. If you look at the example of dwell, dwell time, for instance, it's defined as uh, one visit in an area of interest from entry to exit. And I'm uh, showing a graphic here with uh, two areas of interest and with a gaze uh, path. What is one visit here really? If you look at area of interest A on, on the left, is this the duration of the fixation number two or does it also include the saccade from number one to two? And uh, also in the right hand side area of interest, is it three, four, five, six, the duration of fixations, or also do we include saccades? That depends. Some people do, some people don't. Okay. Some people also, instead of the term dwell time, use the terms such as glance duration or gaze duration or first pass fixation time. That you know, uh, really depends. So it's really crucial that in your study, in your paper, when you report it, you say, you state clearly, what is it that you measure? What is your met metric? And uh, why are you using it uh, in the first place? Uh, for instance, here I'm showing an example of an absolute uh, reading time measure, which is defined as the sum of durations of fixations and saccades in an area of interest, starting with the first fixation, right? And then I explain why uh, this measure might be useful and why it's important in my study, because longer reading time may be related to some processing difficulties. So these are certain assumptions that are making. Some uh, people, they try to use all the eye tracking uh, variables that the eye tracker gives them. I was reviewing uh, a work that focused on uh, Polish voiceover, English subtitles and Polish fun subs. And um, the author here uh, chose all the possible, well, not all, but a lot of uh, different variables. So I think uh, that's a bit uh, too much. When you look at these variables, we have, uh, for instance, gaze duration on an area of interest. But um, at the same time, we also have dwell time. So what is, what is really the difference between dwell time and gaze duration? And why is dwell time in milliseconds and gaze duration is not in milliseconds? Is that different? Or when you look at those two glances count and revisits, is this the same? How do they differ? So when you look at uh, the definitions, when you actually open the manual, which uh, not very many people do, I'm talking about the SMI eye tracker here, so B-Gaze manual. So glances count um, or defined as the number of glances, uh, so saccades coming into the area of interest within a certain period of time, and revisits were exactly the same, but minus one. So uh, because they were revisit. So it doesn't really matter, I think, which one we choose because they are the same with the minus one difference. And when you look at the definition of dwell time, it's the sum of durations of all the fixations and saccades in an area of interest in SMI. And they actually don't have gaze duration. So the measure that was reported in this uh, thesis, what they have is glance duration. So the author really mixed these up. And what is it? It's dwell time plus the incoming uh, saccade. So again, not a big difference here. And what they explain in the SMI um, manual themselves, they say, well, gaze duration is really a reading research term. It's defined exactly <laughs> the same as, uh, as dwell time. So really, really, I think it's quite important for us to understand what kind of measures we are using. Okay. I also mentioned how important it is to prepare properly your research material. And uh, here I'm showing a screenshot uh, with uh, eye gaze overlaid on top, showing a three-line subtitle. But the fixations here fall between the lines, so it's really difficult to say which words are actually fixated. So when you're preparing a subtitle material to be analyzed with eye tracking, I think it's really important to actually make sure that you have a large 
sufficient space between the lines, the so-called leading to help you with study because otherwise you're in trouble. And when you look at, uh, when you think about areas of interest, uh, how you can actually measure things with um, with eye trackers. So when you just have text, it's, it's quite easy. The software automatically divides things uh, for you. But when you work with subtitles, uh, these tend to be burned into the image. So whenever you want to analyze a certain word separately, you would need to draw areas of interest manually. And that obviously, um, it takes ages and then you don't have all the information about word frequency, word length, you'd have to do that manually. So some people have tried to go beyond areas of interest. Uh, I have an example here of a paper by Elsa Perigo et al, who quite cleverly uh, thought, okay, we're going to use this ice scan path uh, software, and what we're going to do is we're going to draw a threshold line that will define our uh, area of interest in the film. And they, uh, what was it? Yes, uh, they defined it in pixels, and whatever was above the threshold line was considered as a fixation on the on the film, and below on fixations. So they were trying to avoid the areas of interest drawing uh, problem here. However, um, the problem here would be that you have no information whatsoever on the timing of subtitles. So if you're interested in the timing, that is really not exactly a good way of um, of doing things that's a bit problematic. But if you if you study something else, um, why not? Another uh, paper that used the idea of the threshold line was a paper by Bisson et al. And uh, they did the same. They, they placed the threshold line pixels um, defined. But this time, they also included the timing of the subtitles to be able to determine uh, where uh, whether fixations actually occurred on the subtitles or not. And I have to say, I, I was teaching, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't present at Jan Louis' um, presentation, so uh, that's a, a screenshot I stole from him with uh, with his eye tracker, the eye tracker he's using, and uh, we're going to use it hopefully uh, soon as well. It's uh, it's possible to um, not to draw areas of interest manually, but to have it all sort of automatic mapping on words, and then you are able to also draw information on word frequency, word length, and basically a number of different word-based measures. So this is uh, how you can you can deal with uh, the problem of area of interest drawing. Another issue, I think, that's quite important uh, when we uh, do studies in media accessibility is the way we profile the participants. I think we sometimes try to come up with our own questions for things that uh, could be measured with some established tests such as uh, language proficiency, working memory capacity, immersive tendency, all sorts of things. And uh, we need to learn how to ask the right questions in the right way. I was uh, participating in a in a PhD defense uh, some time ago, and it was uh, there was a talk about immersion, and I asked the uh, candidate how we can measure immersion, and he said, you know, this is such an elusive concept, it's not really possible to measure immersion. And we know it is, there are immersive tendency uh, questionnaires, there are Perhaps questions you can, that can you help can you use, measure uh, the tendency, so I think it's tests, quite good um, to actually ask questions them, on, you know, uh, light perception, tools. on what the they same, can, for instance, if you're testing things blind people, like that. Blind also, and partially sighted people. Puzzled, so maybe uh, instead of asking them, I are you uh, blind or partially sighted? And a lot of people, when asking about participants' age, they come up with those groups. And uh, the problem with asking about participants' age in, in this way is, of course, first of all, here the categories overlap. And then if you ask uh, about age in, in this way, you are not able to calculate the mean age, standard deviation, the range, uh, etc. So you don't have important information. So next time you want to do this, just ask about actual number or a year of birth perhaps. Uh, yes, I said we need to learn how to ask questions. Um, so, for instance, when you're testing participants' uh, habits when it comes to watching films and you want to know if they visit the cinema very often, if you if you ask very often, quite often, not very often or not at all, it's not very precise and I'm not sure you get the uh, right information there. So, uh, perhaps it's, it's better to be more precise to say, you know, more than one 
once a week, once a week, two or three times a month, etc. So be very precise to be able to answer the actual question how often they um, visit the cinema. I have another example of a study where they were asking questions to children and uh, they showed children a film and then they asked, can you tell me the role of something? And the al obvious answer to this question is, <laughs> yes, I can. No, I can't. Right? So it's not really a great phrasing here. Or uh, I don't know how much sense uh, it makes to actually ask, have you understood this or that? Well, perhaps in some study designs, yes, but not in all studies, I guess. And what does it mean to really understand? So we're sort of getting uh, philosophical. I mentioned that sometimes in our studies, uh, we tend to include uh, unnecessarily, of course, some confounding variables. So have a look here. We have a study on Japanese uh, native speakers and we're interested in age, right? We have young speakers and um, uh, people who are, I want to say old, but let's say more senior. Okay, and then, which is a, a pretty good selection, right? Uh, and then uh, you have an explanation, but you know, the young speakers was available where I was uh, living in Ireland at the time, where uh, myself as PI was located, but then we didn't really have uh, all Japanese speakers at, at, at that time. So we recruited the group <laughs> in, in Japan. So you're sort of confounding age and the geographical location here. So you don't know if your results are going to be due to age or due to the place where they lived. Right, so that's that's an important thing. Uh, when it comes to data analysis, I just have uh, one slide, and uh, I think uh, what is happening, and I owe this to uh, Jan Louis Kruger and uh, David Orego uh, mostly, that I think we need to move uh, from ANOVA tests uh, to more complex uh, models. In ANOVAs, we tend to calculate averages for all subjects. For instance, uh, when you're testing subtitling in eye tracking, so you have one value for all the subtitles per clip per participant. So you're reducing a lot of data and you're sort of losing a lot of information, whereas uh, mixed models take into consideration the fact that your data is not independent and it's like repeated measures uh, designed and the uh, data is correlated, etc. And finally, when it comes to reporting the results, I think we have a couple of things to uh, improve. Um, for instance, uh, when you look at these results, the number of people who participated in a study, what's the order of presentation here? Is it alphabetical? No. Is it numerical? Not really. So it's a bit clumsy and it's a bit difficult to follow. Perhaps a better order would be like an increasing order or decreasing order or alphabetical order, some sort of <laughs> order there. I think in media accessibility research, we also uh, tend to uh, have a lot of graphs that you can't understand when you look at them. Uh, and I'm showing one example here. So we have poor description really of what we have on the X or Y axis. What, what are the units here? What is group one, group two? Are there any significant differences between the groups? So I think graphs should be really self-explanatory. Or another example, uh, when you have different types of subtitles uh, here, and we have a bar chart, so it's not it's not really helpful, I think. Perhaps you need to ask yourself, do I need a bar chart in the first place? Perhaps uh, what I want to present is better in a in a table or in a more sophisticated uh, chart in the in the first place in a box of whisker plots that uh, that I'm showing here, where you have more information there. Some people, they get so excited about fancy eye-tracking visualizations that they uh, don't uh, report any, any actual numbers or statistics, uh, as I'm showing an example here of a heat map and a focus map and uh, no actual uh, numerical uh, results here. Whereas uh, I think when you look at APA standards or some other standard, it's clearly stated what should be reported, you know, not only descriptive and inferential statistics, but also effect sizes more and more recently are demanded. And I've come across um, quite an interesting publication. It's actually a preprint, so it's not an actual publication. It's a guideline for reporting standards of eye tracking research. So the authors actually provide a, a list of what should be reported in an eye tracking study, what kind of information for instance, information on the quality of data, you know, the percentage of uh, trials you have excluded, what were your reasons, what was the obviously number of uh, people, what was the quality threshold, the percentage of lost data, all sorts of things. So it's really mm, super interesting to look at that. Also, um, I think it's important to remember if you want to do an eye tracking study, eye tracking is not your only 
solution to the question, okay? So it's always good to use some other measure to combine eye tracking measures with other measures like self-reports with comprehension, immersion, etc. And then you triangulate all those um, individual methods. I think it's important for us to, uh, to remember that uh, research in, in, in media accessibility should really be good quality and then bad quality research uh, may be retracted. I'm showing an example here, a uh, first page of the famous or infamous uh, paper by Andrew Wakefield from The Lancet on, uh, in which he falsely uh, claimed that the vaccines cause autism, right? So papers can get retracted. And um, related to that, I think what we're facing is really a replication crisis. And it's uh, very difficult to uh, replicate studies because we don't have enough information in the original study. So that's my last slide. I'm providing uh, some do's and don'ts in um, reporting and experimental research with, uh, with eye tracking, but not necessarily eye tracking. So I think it's important to have a clear research question. And I want to do something with eye tracking. It's not really a good research question, right? And then choose appropriate measures to answer your research question and uh, don't forget to define these measures. And again, don't use all the measures that you have in the eye tracker, uh, in the eye tracker software, try not messing up your research design um, in the meantime. We report descriptive and inferential statistics and we're trying to visualize data properly and we don't only, we don't report visualizations only or percentages only. So trying to triangulate the, uh, the data that we have from different sources, different metrics, not only eye tracking. And uh, quite importantly, I think we need to share our research output. So make the data available in an open access repository so that you make it possible for other people to replicate uh, your study. And then you, what you need to report uh, in your paper is, uh, you know, report the whole experiment so that it's uh, possible to replicate it. As I said, that's all for today, but there's uh, much more and uh, I hope to uh, see you again in uh, July, possibly in person in Warsaw. Uh, fingers crossed for this. Uh, thank you very much.